<laughs> yeah, with Warren. Good luck. Hello, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm with my very good friend, Louise. I'm going to shake your hand that I can officially are, on camera. We are very good friends. And we have known each other <laughs> for eek. Eek. Uh, longer than the cameraman's been alive. Longer than the cameraman <laughs> has been alive. We've ascertained that. Yes. But we were both, I was one and you were two. Right. No, no, I was two, you were right. one. Sorry. Yes. Got but on another continent. Yeah, we met in England. Yeah, that's right. At a farm studio. At a farm studio. I Yes, I worked for these brothers, two sets of brothers. Mm -hmm. It was the Hannons and the Jamesons. And the, uh, and the Hannons were Nick and Patch. And Patch was my oldest friend from three years old, and he was the drummer with the Sundays. That's right. And, and I love the Sundays. But it came through Guy Chambers. Did, did it, it Did it? I thought Because Guy, Guy called us and said, Louise all, wants to come in and things, record. All things connect to Guy. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So were you obviously were friends with Guy at the time. And... I was writing with Guy. When ah. I came to London, uh, my manager at the time said, get together with Guy. And he lived up in Muswell Hill. And Like you do if you live in London. <laughs> I was talking to Graham to Coxon the other day, and he lives in Muswell Hill. Yeah. And it all goes back to the kinks. Oh, yes. that was their I know. stomping ground. Yes, I actually I read an interview uh, recently with, about Ray Davies, and the interviewer said, "Here we are sitting on the park bench in Muswell Hill, where Ray Davies broke up with his first girlfriend." Oh wow! <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, people in London they they stay in their little their little they stay in their boroughs. In their boroughs, yes. They stay in their boroughs. Yeah. Anyway, I used to go up there, and then we'd all end up in the Sir Richard Steele's pub at the end of the night in Belsize Park, and. Yeah, I guess I was must have still been writing with him when I was doing that brief thing with Gail Ann Dorsey. Right. Who I'd met, I think it was the early 90s. Yeah, it was probably very early 90s, 91, yeah. maybe 92-ish. Yeah, I wanted to have like a girl duo. Mm -hmm. And I had researched and I, you know, I heard about her and I was like, i got to meet Gail Ann Dorsey. Right. And she came over and I think we were going to call ourselves Femme Fatale. And uh, we did a couple of songs in my London flat. And Where did you live in London at the time? I, well, then I lived off of Chalk Farm. Oh, okay. Right across from Primrose Hill. Which is a beautiful part of London. Yeah, Primrose it's Hill. a beautiful part of London. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really nice. And, and then I had a little studio at one point in Camden Town, right across from Dingwalls. Ah. In the furniture warehouse. I know that area really well. My yeah. One of my old school friends, his grandfather owned the barges down there. So we used to go down there and sit on the barges. And then when I, of course, got to be 16 and pretended to be 18, not that I recommend that, yeah. um, I'd go to Dingles and we'd go and see so many great blues artists would come through. I saw Buddy Guy there. Fantastic. Yeah, this little dank, little dark club. Didn't they tear it down and build it up again? Because I I, I heard they had a fire. I thought it closed, but maybe. And then I saw they're up and running. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a sort of we're talking about classic parts of London: Primrose Hill, Muswell Hill, and of course Camden Town. Yeah. These are like history. Yeah, but they're total art centres. They're still yes. out to this day. You go there, you go to the the markets. It's all just full of, you know, artists and yeah, yep. beautiful. Yeah. But Love where were it. you born originally? Brooklyn. I don't know you're Brooklyn. Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I always thought you were California originally. I know, it's the hair, right? It's the hair, yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't move here. Uh, well, my parents migrated here when I was eight. You were eight? Yes, so, you know, it was East Coast. We lived in Brooklyn for two years. Then we lived in West Orange, New Jersey. We were suburbs, and my parents would drive into... New York 12, to 12, not Tim Pan Alley, as many people believe, but around the corner. 1250 Broadway, um, and they'd write, and they'd come back, and, you know, we had a suburban house with a swimming pool, and every house was kind of... Did you go, did you ever go with them, or did you just sit? No, 
No. I didn't go with them when they wrote. I mean, where would you put us? I was about to say, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, we had school, but I, I was taken at recording studios occasionally. Well, how was that? I think it's the reason why when I'm in recording studios, I feel yeah. like, you know, You're I'm completely at home. Yeah. 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 That totally must be pretty, pretty, pretty wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I went back to visit our house in West Orange, New Jersey. Two years ago, I was on tour and I... I looked at the map and I went, wait a minute, my neighborhood where I grew up is is on the way to the next venue where we're driving. And I was like, we have to stop. We have to at least drive in front of the house. And the owner was, was Butch Norton and I, uh, and our tour manager, James Larson. And we pull up and the owner of the house is raking. And I say, hey, I used to live there. He said, oh, I thought you were one of those tourists who, you know, wanted to see the house where the songwriters lived. You actually lived here? And I, and I said, yeah. He said, well, come on in. Let me show you around. Oh. So I have photographs and films of me walking in all the rooms, mm -hmm. which had very much not changed. You know, there was a couple of those, like one little dividing wall that knocked out. But my father had all the studio faders on all mm -hmm. the bedrooms. So those, those are still there. They're still there? They're still there. Yeah, we had the, you know, like the ones you see at Village. But mm -hmm. Oh, I know the ones. Yeah, uh, the 60s thing. And it was, you know, it was that thing of, it's so small. Right. <laughs> I remember this being so big and it's yeah. so small. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was a fun experience. But yeah, then... Did then, you ever t at any point tell him that you were related to the people? Oh, that you oh yeah, yeah, oh, I okay, did. Right. Yeah, he was showing me pictures in the magazine. Mm -hmm. There's Weird New Jersey. You know, there's a mm -hmm. magazine. Weird New Jersey. They do weird California, weird everything. It's just... I don't know about the one. I'll have to check that one out. Weird. Yeah, it's um, just... It's details you need to know about a place. Oh, okay. <laughs> of the nooks and crannies nooks and, the and, folk, crannies. and the folklore. Yeah, and there were pictures of my parents and me as a baby there. Because so you're the my, oldest. I am, yeah. I mean the youngest, sorry. Well, <laughs> music keeps me young, yeah. for sure. So then, came out to California. Yeah. How old were you? You said eight? Eight. 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 Yeah. yeah Did came you go up to the canyon then? Yeah. I yeah. went to Wendelin Avenue School. You know, Slash went there too. He came over to my studio like a, last year or something and was like, oh, I used to go to that school. Yeah, I'm working on the Slash hair. You are working <laughs> on the Slash hair. Just get the perma glasses and the hat and yeah. you're fine. I got a hat. <laughs> yeah, so we went there, and it, it was it was huge. I mean, West Orange was very kind of proper, mm. you know, and then suddenly I was in hippie school, and it freaked me out. It was like, what? You know, I remember, okay, very famous artist, Ed Keenholz. Mm -hmm. I went to school with his son, and, you know, there are, some of his art is like, a dog with a knife in its eye or a window you roll down and then there's a car accident. Anyway, so I went to his house, one mm -hmm. of my school friends, and his father was making a plaster of Paris mold of his wife's breasts in the garage. Right. And there was all these crazy artwork everywhere and it just, it felt dangerous, you know, from... From, from the, suburban from New Jersey. Suburb, suburbia, yeah it, yeah. it felt dangerous. And then my father started riding a motorcycle and opened a recording studio and, and life just went from safe to insane so that was did your parents change. grow up fairly conservatively on the east coast when i when you say conservative i mean just very suburban just working class so it was for them too as well they probably came out here and yeah. were like so the whole family experience was like whoa california it, it, yeah it was it was it was like it was i think culturally for everyone it was the eye eye opener mm -hmm. you know freedom and self-expression and music was amazing and we drive in the canyon and my mother named our carmen gear karma it was so embarrassingly hippie Karma uh, <laughs> for the common gear. I like yeah. that. Yeah, and then, you know, we'd go to the health food store down on Fairfax, which is no longer there next to what used to be the Chalet Gourmet, which is no longer there. I think that was there up until like 20 years ago, wasn't it? Probably. Yeah, I remember it. And we'd drive by and she'd say, oh, that's Shaka Khan's house, or that's where Joni Mitchell lives, you know, mm -hmm. it would be like that. So we're in your home studio. Yes. And this is where you, you've been cutting vocals for your record. What are you yes. using? Oh, you're using the Vanguard. Yes. That's a Dave Way recommendation, isn't it? Yes. Well, it was Peter Chun, who works with Dave, uh, 
was doing some work with them. And I think around the same time that Peter brought them to Dave, they were in Dave's studio when we started cutting mm -hmm. for Dave to try out. I sung on the trumpet. Did you see the trumpet? Mm -hmm. The first day. The second day, I think he just set that up because he might have had that on drums the first day. I can't remember. And then I think he switched things around and say, oh, let's, eh, let's try this on vocals, see what it sounds so like. So you're really loving it. And I, I just sung on it. And then I was like, that vocal sounds amazing. What did you do? And he's like, I don't know, just, you know, Vanguard. So I was sold on the Vanguard at that point, And I have a stereo pair of them. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and it's it's an affordable. And what's mic. your vocal chain? The combination of this and this. So you really love the burl the and the lunchbox. And I have to say, you know, I just like I don't upgrade anything because there's this magic thing called flow that happens when you mm -hmm. get everything talking to each other nicely, and you sure. just don't want to mess with it. And that's happening in this little tiny room right now. Yeah. Where I plug something in, plug the guitar in, bring up the fader, and go. That sounds amazing. You know, mm -hmm. don't touch anything. What What's going right? You know, I, so I'm very happy. Yeah, it's a great change. So you're 512, 560 into the Inward Connections brute. So. Yeah. Very nice indeed. Now, when you are doing acoustic, are you just pulling that down and using it, using the Vanguard or? I, I've done, but well, so this was. Yeah, I was this, wondering what this was. This is a stager and it's a guy in Nashville. His name is Stager. It's a ribbon mic. And I was guessing it must be a ribbon. It's a ribbon mic. And I have to say, okay, so <laughs> the only reason I got this mic is because I signed on to Reverb, a site you should never go on because you will just spend a lot of money on it. <laughs> um, and I saw this mic and I saw a lot of reviews of it and I saw that it was a real cottage industry with one guy mm -hmm. making stuff. And I thought, you know, I've never bought a mic in my entire life that somebody didn't tell me to get. I'm getting this one because I want it. <laughs> and my gut says, you know, and I thought, I'm going to go tell Dave I got this mic and he's going to go, no, why'd you, you know. Yeah. I, I just thought, I'm just going to get one. Mm -hmm. It's like a girl going shopping. Like, a, sure. it, was a, it was a compulsive buy. But I have been very happy. And I'll tell you one thing I remember Peter Asher said. He said, if you want to figure out how a mic sounds, just look at it, because mics always sound the way they look. <laughs> got That's, the Hofner we were jamming with earlier. Yes, well the Deluxe is the, it's the edge, you know, tripped out yep. Deluxe. Oh yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And your Martin, which I was playing, was gorgeous. It was a D35, I think. And you've got a Jag. I love the Jag. Jag. And, I, and I, have, um, I have some beautiful guitars up, upstairs in my living room that I, I don't... I did see those when we went yeah. through. Yeah. Beautiful. So, and then keyboard wise, we got the, the Yamaha. Yeah. And that actually, I haven't plugged that in yet, but I got that at Black Market Music in the 90s. I remember Black Market very well. Yes. And actually, David Jenkins used to work there, you know, True Tone here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got that. That was in Lookout Mountain. That was my first kind of fun old keyboard. I, I think I got every sound out of it you could possibly get out of it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. And then what are you marching with? Oh, you got the Adams A7s. Those are, those are beautiful. Yeah, actually those were recommended by Greg Wells. There you go. He recommended those. Gorgeous. Yep. And you're running Pro Tools. Now, you, look, you, so you've been getting... You just mentioned soundtrack stuff, so that's that's great. I mean, that's like the that's where every artist is trying to get stuff, you know, trying to get stuff into film and TV licensing. Yeah, know. it's it's frustrating. Here's the thing: I always was grateful that I was a musician and not an actor because I always felt if you were an actor, you needed somebody else to give you a job to do what you do. Right. But if you're a musician, you can be making music whether you have a job or not. You can be writing songs. I love that. It's great. Analogy. Yeah. Yeah, so the thing about that is if you're not working, you know, and you're creative, it's just you're constantly making content and masters, mm -hmm. and then you, you hope that you'll find an outlet for it that it'll, that it will go somewhere. So, you know, records don't really sell anymore. It's really more about live now, and, and it's almost like a record is building your brand so that people can come see you live. 
Absolutely. And it's almost like, here, hear my mm. music for free, and then come see me play. It's really morphed into something else now. So I, I feel good making masters that I'm really proud of. And yes, you do. You do hope it will find outlets in places where people will hear it. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Well, but wait there, you, because I, I didn't know this. You told me earlier that you were on the movie poster limit, uh, for Fast Times at Richmond High, and you were the youngest artist on it. Yes. Why did I not know that? Things I've seen that movie ten thousand times. Like well, most you can't. People. You can't hear my song very much. It's very, very quiet in like a mall scene. Is it a mall scene? Yeah. I'm gonna go it, back and watch it. it. It's a good story because when I was making my first record, Cam and Crow was still a journalist, mm-hmm. transitioning to book writer. So he had just written Fast Times at Ridgemont High, the book, and mm-hmm. the story was as he posed as a student. Yes. And and he wrote it from the point of view of pretending to be a student, and then. Then he got the movie deal, which was his first movie. And there was a soundtrack, and because I had been produced by Danny Korchmar, I was in the camp of Don Henley and Irving Azoff, and they were putting together that soundtrack, and everyone was like, that's an important soundtrack to get on. And I had written with Jana Allen, who is, you know, Sarah Smile? Mm -hmm. Sarah is Jana's big sister. Oh, I see. Okay, so Jana lived around the corner from her sister. Um, Daryl's apartment was there on Christopher Street, and uh, Jana, Al, and I were writing. Um, and, and I think she and I wrote that song, did we? Uptown Boys, yeah. We wrote that song in Christopher Square, you know, 4th Street, there off of 7th in New York, mm-hmm. you know, New York. And we were out in the park writing the song, and we see this guy going around saying, oh, I can't find my keys. I can't find my keys. And she's going, we're going to get, guy can't find his keys. What's going on? And then all of a sudden we see him pick something up, stick it in his mouth, and he goes, my teeth. Oh. I can't find my teeth. <laughs> so we used to hang out in that area and take our <laughs> notebooks and write songs. And, and I wrote that song with her, actually. Great. Yeah. Yes, my parents were songwriters, but I used to sit in my room and study Fantasia. I used to look at the gatefold of Mickey Mouse and mm-hmm. I'd listen to the, the orchestration and I'd listen to Beatles records and Monkeys records, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that it wasn't cool to like the Monkeys at that age. And I, I loved music and I didn't really watch my parents write songs. I saw their interaction, but it was a very private thing. It'd be like, we're working out, you know, mm-hmm. don't come in because it would be very focused and very intense. Yeah, so I I didn't really get lessons, but I did get the permission. Mm -hmm. I got, oh, grown-ups can do this, you know. Mm -hmm. And mommy and daddy, even though they may not live together anymore, they still write songs together. So it also had that message of unification. You know, when you write a song, there's a unifying element. I think that's probably has a lot to do with my drivenness with songs. It, to me, it probably as a child, it brings people together, it freezes time, it freezes innocence, there's a lot of elements to it, I think, that impacted my DNA. Right. That's beautiful. Yeah. Was Kid Blue your first record? It was, yeah. Yes. I used to have that. Really? Back in England with my, my record collection. I didn't bring my record collection with me for some unknown reason. I maybe could hook you up with one. <laughs> I, I remember the album. Yeah, I think I have a couple of vinyls of them. Yeah, it was, this was obviously on vinyl, I had it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I made that record in... What, you were 16? It came out when I was 19. When you were 19? Yeah. So um, you maybe recorded it at 18 or mm-hmm, something? Yeah, yeah that, that's true. I mean, I, there were a lot of years that I wished I didn't make the record because I kind of wish I'd lived more life before going into the music business. Mm-hmm. But at the time, you could not have talked me out of going to make a record. There's just no way you would have talked me out of it. I just was, like, chomping at the bit, and I got a record deal, and I was still in high school. And, in fact, Steve Wax, who signed me to Electra, was like, I'm not going to let you make a record till you finish high school. And I was like, what? He's mm-hmm. like, no, I just I can't let you make this record till you finish high school, finish high school, then you can make the record. So I was like, going, oh and you know, writing songs during my last year of high school. 
and I wanted to go to college, and I looked at a few colleges, and I remember going to a few concerts with college kids, you know, in the audience and going, is this what college kids act like? God, they seem so immature and young. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I want to go to college. If this is college kids and it's going to be a continuation of high school, I'd rather go make a record. You know? mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there were years I looked back and I thought, well, maybe I would have had more maturity with my first record because at that point I had Danny Korchmar, I had L.A. seasoned musicians. We cut things in, um, I think, was record one around then? I, I know we did Sunset Sound Factory. Who was the engineer and the producer? Dennis Kirk was engineering. Um, I feel like Greg Wadani was around uh, coming and going at the time. Were you in A with the little L-shaped room and the API? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that room. And, and I was in there. Val Garay used to work in there for years. Yes. With Peter Asher. Well, actually, the story of that room is George Massenburg, I think, dialed in that room. Mm -hmm. This is my memory. And George Massenburg built the record one room to be like that room. He, I, think, I think it was Val Garay who copied it. It was Val Garay? Yeah, because Val Garay owned record one. Okay, so, but there was a Massenburg connection to this Probably, yeah. sound, the Sunset Sound Factory. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know, I know Val, and I know his, that was record one was his studio, and he copied that. He even got the same vinyl So tiles. did Val work with George Massenburg? Probably, but he was Peter Asher's engineer for right de for over a decade. And, and Peter, Peter was the reason why I worked with Danny Korchmar ah. because I went to P Peter Asher to produce me. Oh, you did. And Peter said, "You know what? I'll tell you who would make an amazing producer: Danny Korchmar." And Danny hadn't produced a record yet, but I was the first record Danny produced, and Danny had been on the scene with Peter on several James Taylor records and Linda Ronstadt records, and a lot of times. Danny came up with arrangements, you know, which were hit records, like the slowing down of the song Handy Dan Handyman, mm -hmm. I'll Be Your Handyman, which was an old song, Faster. Uh, so Danny had a lot of arrangemental ideas and things that had worked with James Taylor, and so Danny was a producer. But, yeah, here's the thing. So I, I felt like at that age, I was more quiet, singer-songwriter, lyrical. And Danny was into punk, so oh, he, he pushed me in this rock direction. And I, I, you know, I was young, and when you're young and you go to a producer and you've never made a record before, you, you know, you kind of go along with it. So I made this very rock record, which I felt there was a little bit of a disconnect, you know, between who I was and what I was doing. Uh, and then the, the follow-up to that record, for some reason, Danny thought I should sing in high keys. And so I sound like, you know, I sound like I'm reaching and even younger than I sound on the first record. Um, and it was, it was a not very, I don't know, that second record, I always, I stayed up a lot of nights going, what's wrong? It's wrong. I don't know how to fix it, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, and, it, and it, took a, it took a bunch of years, but I, I really wanted to get to the point where I, one, wouldn't go, it's wrong, but if I did, I'd know how to fix it. It was a terrible feeling to just know it's not what I want, but I don't, I don't know what to say to put it on the course I wanted to. I don't have the language or the confidence or the experience or any of that. So when I, when I went to England, I had a, an A-track, a half-inch A-track in my front room. Mm -hmm. That's when I worked with our mutual friend, yep. uh, um, Julie Daniels. And I was just obsessed with figuring out what every instrument was doing. What's the bass playing? Why do I love these drums? You know, what is it about this? I just went through this stage of deconstructing records and trying to, you know, somehow imitate each part to figure out what made it go pop. and. Mm -hmm. That was a great time because in the, what year did you, did you come to England? The very end of 84. 84. Yeah. Because of course you had Chrissy Hind who kind of ruled over there with sort of her version of punk and new wave, probably more. Yeah. Yeah. And she was an American girl with the English band. So did you have that kind of? Well, I, I yeah, I loved The Pretenders. I, those first two records Amazing. were just like inhaled them mm -hmm. completely. And, th and then when I got there, I was like, damn, I got to 
London too late. Now it's... <laughs> in 84. <laughs> it was like, oh, God, <laughs> in 84 it was too late. It's like all blue-eyed soul now, you know? It's I suppose all... it, was, it was the jam had broken up and it was the style council. It was this. It was... Well, what's wrong with the style council? Nothing's wrong with the style <laughs> Nothing's council. Nothing's wrong with but the style But at the time, you probably were like... It was the edgy. No, it, it was Alison Moyet. It oh, was, yeah, Alf. It, yeah, yeah, it was that. Yazoo. It was Spanda Ballet. And I ended up I ended up working with Swain and Jolly, actually. They oh, produced you did? a record from, from me. So, yeah, and then I knew all these just amazing musicians in L.A. and New York. I got the record deal in London, so I stayed in London to just... Ex- it, it was a new universe for me. I was like... I can completely start a new life here. I went there one of the rare winters that actually snowed. It does occasionally, yes. yes. Very, very occasionally. Yes. I think if we looked up, we would see that it snowed in, in the winter of 1984. Beautiful. <laughs> and did you make the record in London? I made a record in London with Swain and Jolly, and then I made another record on Dave Gilmore's boat, Astoria. And by that point, I, I don't know... We just kept recording and doing different versions of things. And then my record company that I was signed to got eaten up by another record company. And they just said, you don't have a hit on your way. So I had this record in the, in the can, so to speak. Which so that's they, how you would have known Andy, because Andy would have been Dave's yes, engineer. Yes, he worked there. He, we knew each other from Astoria. Do you remember how you came to the studio I was working at? I, it was with Andy. Yeah, I don't. And I don't. Gail. I don't remember which phone calls happened to <laughs> get me there, but I definitely remember you there, and I remember that you worked with the Sundays or the studio had something to do mm-hmm. with the Sundays. Because Guy, had, remember... Guy had been there. Guy had been there and written. We actually had some of Guy's gear there, I think. Yeah. So it would have been the time you were writing with Guy, and I remember. Um, I think he produced one of the tracks for the Deep Season. Remember the Deep Season, which was Kevin and. Lindsay Jameson. Lindsay actually went off and played with Ben Folds Five. It was the drummer oh, okay. of Ben Folds Five. And yeah. uh, for me, and my little piece of the story, I mean, that was such an incredibly creative part of my life. Everybody I knew. Mm-hmm. When I think about it now, I'll, I'll do. A, I'll, I'll have my two-minute segue. There was a two. Bro- there was two sets. Three sets of brothers. Sorry. There was yes. the Butchers, and Matt Butcher, mm-hmm. and Jute Butcher. Matt was a front of house guy. Jute was a was a uh, staff engineer at the BBC. Mm-hmm. So insanely talented matt is and was blur's front of house from like 90 89 90. Mm -hmm. so this was so you had those guys so you had this world-class engineer Mm -hmm. this world-class front of house engineer then you had these other two sets of brothers one was in was in the sundays his brother maintained the studio was an incredible musician and then there was another pair of brothers that was this incredible drummer and they ended up with Ben Foles and was also this um, Kevin was this incredible songwriter and it was just it was insane Kevin, uh, Kevin Jameson so Kevin they're James. all like all these guys in this and I was sort of surrounded by just massive talent and everybody's gone off and made careers and still makes money in music so for me, and I remember, so I think that the band was the deep season and they called me and said, we've got a show out of town. And this girl called Louise is coming in with blah de blah and blah, 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 you know, Andy and Louis and, and girl and, and, and they need to come in and record for, for a few days and we're not going to be here, so off I go. have no idea what we recorded. Nor do I. <laughs> I don't even know what, but I do remember that... Gail couldn't be around cats. Yes, and we had a studio cat. I remember, that I remember. And the cat was like, it was called Samson. It was so big. She was like, I'm allergic to cats. Not only am I allergic to cats, but yeah. this cat is like massive. Crazy. And she just like, she got there the first day and she was just like eyes watering up. Yeah. And, <laughs> but Andy, God bless him, I mean, we, we got tones up in half an hour. He was like, well, we're here now, let's just make something happen. And I remember we just threw up some drum mics. And I remember he, we had, we had a pair of 87s. Um, I'm D112. thinking of a song. You're thinking of a song? Do you have it somewhere? I think it's a song, it's something sacred. Maybe. Uh, about the North Country. It was slow. Was there some slow song? I it think was like, yeah. I heard this song and I'm like, when did I record this? I think there was a song called, Have You Ever Wanted Something Sacred? It was more tuneful than that rendition, but yeah, I... I we um, have to find it. 
Can you find it? That would be amazing. Yeah, I, can, I probably can. I probably can. Yes. That would be amazing. There's a f yes, because it was a... What happened is, what I did with Gail amalgamated into a band I started calling South of Venus. Maybe that is what it was, South of Venus songs. It wasn't a Japanese drummer, was it? I don't remember. <laughs> a drummer who was so badass. I was wrong. I mean, everybody was. I wanted great. to loop him. I mean, I had I had rehearsal tapes that I just mm -hmm. wanted to loop and make records out of because mm -hmm. his groove was so in the pocket. Yeah, I mean, everybody was a great player, and we did finish the song. I mean, that was Andy's. Like, he'd never been in the room before. He just asked me questions. We threw stuff up. I mean, it was a good learning experience for me all around because I remember thinking like, oh, I'm dealing with a guy here that, uh, you know, knows how to get. Schnizzle done, you know, it was all Schnizzle? Like, yeah. <laughs> Pair of 87s, measuring off in phase with the snare. One kick mic, one snare mic, four mics on the drum kit, pull it up, tiny bit of compression on the snare top, bump. And it was an amazing drum sound. And we were just like making music. So if I sent you songs, would you go, It was that was one of them or not? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. I don't know what it would, I don't know what trigger. it would trigger in my mind. Yeah. I do find masters and I go, who did I do this with? Where did I do this? I uh, I sent Chad Fisher, who used to be my next door neighbor. Well, you, yes. Who I now <laughs> own his house. Oh, that's of course. <laughs> you live yeah. next door to where I used to live. Yes. Okay, right. So Chad. But Jono has your house, doesn't he? I don't know that man, but I've okay. heard of him. A friend yes. of mine has been at a party at his house and taken a picture in the backyard yes. saying, is this where you used to live? And I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you just tapped right into the community. Cause yeah. th that's what happened when I left London. I, I was nervous about coming back to L.A. because I thought L.A. was going to be the sprawl of people who just, what have you done for me lately? And, you know, I, I, I had that sense of musical community in London and I thought I wouldn't find it here. Then I land right where you are, with Chad next door and Dan, and across the street. It, it was just mu music central. And how did well then? We should not ignore him. How did Josh come to live with you? Uh, Josh, wh where did I meet Josh? I think well, I met him at. Did you meet him through Chad? Because I think I met him through Chad. Chad was the drummer in um, School of Fish. School of Fish. Yeah, and I think Josh it, was the singer. Yeah. Yes. I think I met Chad when I moved in, and I met Josh there. Uh, Josh was signed to A&M for a minute. He was yep. finishing his first record. Um, we hit it off. He then was living in Topanga for a while. I don't remember the order of events, but he needed a place to stay, and I had this back house that I rented to him. So, you know, we were roomies, basically, you know meet in the kitchen, have something to eat, and you know, then he'd be back in his his little room, which later became a drum room. When, when, when Greg and I started going out, we turned my house, the one where Jono mm -hmm. lives, was the first Rocket Carousel studio. Mm. Actually, the first Rocket Carousel studio, I must say. When Greg and I were going out, I got him a birthday present, which was one of those wind-up tin toys, mm -hmm. and it had tin rockets that, you know, would come up oh, okay. and go around, and mm -hmm. it, it said Rocket Carousel, and I thought, that's the best name for a studio, and I cut it out, and I taped it to his little writing room at Rondor Publishing. I said, your studio is now called Rocket Carousel. So then when we turned Lookout into Rocket Carousel, it was that, and then when we moved to the Palisades, it's like, we can't put a studio here, can't put drums here, and went to Culver City, and that took the name. Anyway, there you have it. The history of Lookout Mountain yep. and how it transformed, yep. Transformed all of our lives. Everyone's. So, because I, la I landed October 95, and Chad's the drummer on our record. We had chosen him because of the Laszlo Bain record that he had done. We I heard didn't know that. that. And so Julie and I would be like sitting in her her flat in London listening to stuff and um, 
she's like, I really like this guy. I think he's really cool. I love what he's, love his music and listen to the drums. We're like, oh, okay, great. And he used to be in this band called School of Fish. And so, and I think, wasn't he with Lisa? He played in Nine Stories as well. Lisa loves Nine Stories. There was, the, yeah, there was definitely a, a Boston connection yeah, with and, Lisa and Chad. And Duncan and Brown, Sheik. Brown and Brown University. And all, and, of, yeah. Yeah. all of these, yeah, yeah, all of the Boston people. So we, so I remember I was probably, I mean, we landed on like a Saturday and we started work on a Monday. So I'm here like two days and I'm in the studio with Don Smith, God rest his soul, one of the greatest engineers ever. So in the room with, mm -hmm. with Don and the drummer is Chad. And that's next weekend, so on one weekend he's like, oh, come to my house for a barbecue. And I go to the house for barbecue and there you are. There is um, Jeff Trott. Um, I mean, it was just like every Dan, obviously. Yes. Dan Rothschild. And what's now my studio was like the jam room. And we all went in there and jammed, and I was very intimidated. I wasn't like I was earlier where I was playing. I was just kind of like strumming C. Because I'm like in a room, and I'm like, I know everybody here. That guy played on that record, I really like. And the guy, and I'm just like <laughs> strumming C and G in the background. And I remember Chad was playing drums. I think you were playing piano. Probably. Yeah. And it it was, was fun. I, I should dig up. I, um, I cut a single in Chad's studio, now your studio. Josh is playing drums on it. Oh, wow. Um, it's called Starfish Girl. And I put it out on Fish of Death. Sorry. Fish of I, Death. Michael's. I put, Michael's I put it out on Fish of Death Records. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just pressed up a vinyl. Yeah. But it, it's very fun. Yeah. I, and it was a song that I was playing and wrote in London in the South of Venus days. And I, my name that I was going under there then was Twig. I was twig. Twig. I was just calling myself Twig. <laughs> From one single. <laughs> nice. But it's very pop, it's very fun. And I love Josh's drumming on it. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear him play drums. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, there was, there's, I found a master. I thought, this is really cool. This is a really cool song. I love the harmony in it. I mean, a lot of the songs were slow. And I found Chad and I said, did we write this together? He goes, and I had never heard it before. I said, it sounds like we recorded on your studio. I mean, I, I have a vague memory that we recorded this in your studio. He's like, I didn't write it. That's happened several times where I said, did we write this? And people go, I didn't write that. I'm going, great, thanks, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened a few times, but uh, I always say it's really great when you have a dream and you write this great song with Bono in the dream and you wake up and you go, I wrote this hit song with Bono. And then you remember the song and realize it's a dream and that you really didn't co-write it with anyone, you can just write it down. That's pretty beautiful. Yeah. If you remember it. If you and remember you, it. And usually it's not as good as you believed it to be when you were sleeping. <laughs> so, flash forward. We obviously were with Dave, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago, Dave Way, mm -hmm. and you've been making a record with him. Yes. So tell me Amazing. about that process. Okay. The, the crazy original history to this is that, unbeknownst to me, Dave Way met or saw Billy Harvey play in Austin and said, I really like this guy. And I'm, I'm telling you just what Dave told me. This guy's really soulful. You know, he's very cool. Name check. And I think maybe either brought him to L.A. or introduced him to people he was working with who then said, come to L.A. Uh, to do some project. I didn't know about any of this. All I know is David Bearwald, who used to live on Lookout Mountain as well, mm -hmm. uh, a little further down. And I was at Tony Berg's place a couple years ago, maybe four years ago. And I, this, this was my thinking. Okay, at that point I had tots. We know what tots are, little people running around with runny noses who need a lot of love and care. And they were getting a little bigger and I thought, you know, all my songs are on my hard drive. I actually don't know how to play any of my songs. I just have them there. And I know how the arrangements go, but if you ask me to play, you you know, sit down and play me one of your songs, I wouldn't know how to play them. So I set this goal for myself. I thought, I'm going to go out and do some gigs. And I wanted to just get one other person, in, and I wanted specifically another songwriter who could also play so that we could play on each other's songs. That was my thinking. And I was at Tony Berg's. He gave me a couple of names. I called Billy Harvey, 
which was one of them. I went out to Silver Lake to, to meet this guy who I knew nothing about, really. Um, <laughs> the day we met, it was actually on Halloween when I went to meet him for the first time. So I was wearing a red wig that day and I had like the Queen of Hearts costume in my car. And I had a ukulele and a guitar and I'm like, where is him? There was this big architectural house that he was just in the front of. And that's how I sh showed up on his doorstep saying, hi, I'm Louise, you know, and that was, he was like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> but um, what happened over the next year is we wrote a lot of songs and we decided and we played some gigs and we decided to, to be a duo. And for whatever reason, we just both had our own records we were making and our solo careers. And we just never really could get it together. Like we really had the best of intentions to do this, but we were both busy people. And then he moved to New York and he moved to Nashville. And uh, so that happened and I had a Dropbox folder full of songs I'd written with Billy, which is more songs than he's ever written with anyone, he says, because he's kind of a solo guy. Um, then I go to support one of my friends who's playing at the cinema bar. I'm going to go see them. I'm going to watch them play. And Dave is there. And Billy had told me about Dave. And Billy had said something about Dave and loved working with him. And Dave said, you got to come to the way station sometime. And I said, OK, kind of the way station. Nothing happened. Then we both, uh, it was interesting because I was on Facebook and I posted something and then Carl Wallinger wrote a comment. And I'm like, bloody hell, Carl Wallinger just sent me a comment, you know? <laughs> I love Carl Wallinger. So I write him back. He says, I'm playing at the Troubadour tomorrow. Do you want to come? And I'm like, damn right I want to come. So I go there and Dave is there. And again, he says, come to the way station. Just come over, bring a song. And I said, OK, great. Who's the band? And, and I'm like, how about these guys? And it's Brian McLeod, <laughs> Lyle Workman. You know, it's like, you know, really slumming it in L.A. <laughs> that, that's what happened. We, um, we went there one day a couple of years ago, and amazing band. And I brought a song, which was an older song of mine that I did in the 80s way, and I had re, you know, harmonized the voicings on it. And we cut this record, and we actually didn't finish it. Like, 10 months later, I was like, hey, Dave, should we finish it? <laughs> you right. know, and I came over one day, and it was, it was done. And so I put it out on the, the, the last record. And this is where Mitch Redmond comes in. I had taught uh, a songwriting class at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, and one of the people there was uh, someone who had been in radio a really long time, he'd grown up in it, and was, but he's also, you know, directed films and a songwriter himself and um, loves gear and loves technology. Anyway, he took a couple of my CDs, and then before I knew it, he was saying, why are you not in the studio? Like, what? this record you made with Dave Way, this 5th of July, you know, like, you should be in the studio you know, making the White Album. <laughs> and I go, yeah, that would be nice. You know, I'll do a pledge campaign. And, and, and then he was just insisting that I go in the studio. I was sending him songs. I said, well, actually, I have a Dropbox folder filled with songs, There's songs I had of my own, and then I had songs with Billy, and it added up to, like, 50 songs. And he said, go in the studio, call Dave right now. You know, I'll foot the bill for it. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so I called Dave, and um, we had also done, between, I, I should say, between 5th of July, um, I did a project with Chris Seafried where we did covers of Me Mum's tunes, Me Mum and Dad, um, for Sony, because they wanted it for licensing, so we did The Locomotion and Natural Woman, and I Feel the Earth Move, and, and Dave mixed those. Now, I, mean, I got asked all these questions. Your dad wrote the lyrics to Natural Woman? He did, yes. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I like that. And the title came from Jerry Wexler. It's a good story. I think I know the story, but why don't you tell it again? Well, the story is my father is going through New York and sees Jerry Wexler. Either one of them's in a taxi. I don't remember which one's in a taxi. And it was just passing in a busy street. And Jerry Wexler says, Jerry! I got a title for you. 
What's that? Natural woman. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Yeah, I got a title for you. <laughs> Bye. We're <laughs> gonna go catch the A train or whatever. Yeah, it's like I got a title for you, natural woman. So my mother and father wrote, you know, the, the song from that. I just love the idea that a man wrote. You make yes. me feel like a natural woman. Yeah, yeah. The lyric, I yeah. don't know if. I don't know if it was, I got a song, I got a title for you for Aretha. I don't know if it was written for her, maybe, because Jerry Wexler worked with, maybe they were pitching for her immediately, thinking her mm -hmm. singing it. Uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, back to Dave. Mm -hmm. Wonderful Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, and talented. So we, we had worked on those things, mixed things, and then I got a soundtrack, Bad Santa. I don't know, just, we did odd ends here and there. And um, then when I got this call, go in the studio, I was like, hey, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I got a bunch of tunes, you know. Uh, he's like, yeah, come on over. And let's listen to some, some songs. And the, the list kept getting longer. It started off probably as like 15 songs. And then I started going through all my hard drives and going, oh yeah, that one, that one. I forgot about that one. And kept throwing more tunes in. There's still a whole bunch more. Right now it's like a double record. So we were going to start on election day, but we didn't realize it was election day. And then I said, you know what? I think maybe we should wait a day because I don't think, I think we're all gonna be really distracted today. So we actually started the record the day after the election. Well, that must have been <laughs> it was like, first we're either going to be in a <laughs> jubilant mood or have a lot to say. Well, either other. way, we're definitely going to have a lot to say. Yeah. 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 Anyway, it has just been the, mm -hmm. it has been just uh, the best experience. It's, yeah, we've had amazing real. musicians, people we both knew and, and, and Charlie Drayton was actually in town and I was in a, there's a whole chapter we missed. There's many chapters we missed, but there was a brief period of time I was in a band in New York with Steve Jordan and Charlie Drayden and Sarah Lee. And they went on, they were called the Raging Hormones. And they had a different, different lineups over a couple of years. This is right before I went to London the first time. And so I played with both those guys and Charlie was in town and it was just so fun to be able to get him and in the Steve studio. Steve Jordan as well, yowza. Well, Steve was not in on this record, but... Um, right, but the, the, you played with him, there was... Yes, this was a, the band was really, really fun because everyone was switching instruments. So, you know, I mean, Charlie's a great bass player, a great drummer, Steve's great on all the instruments, you know, I, I would move around. I mean, I didn't play drums in that band, but you wouldn't want to. You know, and I wanted to be in that band and I wanted to go to London with them, but... Dave Robinson of Stiff Records had come to see me in New York. I said, come see my band. Because he said, ah, I heard these songs, you know, I'll talk to you about a record deal. I go, oh no, I'm in a band. Come to New York and hear my band. The day he came, Charlie got hit by a bus Ooh. and was late for rehearsal for two hours. Dave's waiting for the band, waiting for the band, waiting for the band, you know, to show up. And then Charlie shows up and he's all in a cast. And he sits down at the drums and goes, with the other arm just goes whap <laughs> and we start playing you know with him with this all with the one arm yeah and it, it was it was a bit of a falling apart rehearsal and he walked me to the to the lift to the elevator mm -hmm. and he said yeah come to london um but don't bring the band <laughs> oh wow and and i came to london for 10 days i had no intention of staying i was only going for 10 days but i did stay 10 years 10 years yes yeah, that's a that's, that's a lot longer than ten days. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. For my little treehouse place here. Oh, it's fantastic. It's beautiful. Yeah. As ever, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. I'll see if I can ask Louise them directly. Okay. And thanks a lot. Have a thanks. marvelous time recording and mixing.